and we will be doing stations 13 and 14 and so finishing the traditional version of the Stations of the Cross. Uh, yes, there are different versions. Some of them are um, purely scriptural, well, whereas the ones we're following are the traditional ones which have um, traditions of the church. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the, the face cloth uh, that uh, is supposed to be uh, created uh, when Monica uh, wipes the face of Jesus and things like that. So, But they do teach us something and um, they're worthwhile going through. And I hope you've um, gotten something out of, out of the previous four sessions. So a good morning to you all. Say hi before we set off. Um, what news is happening? Um, well, I'm working on the anchor at the moment. So hopefully you will receive from Margot um, a request for your intercessions. If you can get them as quickly to her as possible, that would be marvellous. Um, so I can uh, get the anchor out to you with all the details of Holy Week um, uh, as soon as possible, meaning this week. Um, and also it frees me up for um, Holy Week as well. Um, I do believe that uh, Margot's already sent uh, a list out. Um, and uh, it's quite straightforward. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all the services are eight, 7 o'clock. Friday, Good Friday is 10 a.m. And then Holy Saturday is the Great Vigil at 8 p.m. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. And I do hope that uh, if you're able to attend, you will do. Um, if not, please do watch us online. And let me just say good morning to Kit, Laurie, Karen and Bill. It's good to have you here this morning and thanks for spending time with me. Uh, finally, if you um, looked at the services that are available for this month, you will have noticed that there is a service tomorrow night. No, what day is it today? Tuesday. <laughs> Thursday night uh, for the Annunciation. Um, so um, if you'd like to attend that and you're near enough, you know, please do. Uh, otherwise, um, we will be live streaming it. Um, so please do join us for that, for the Annunciation. Uh, Father Lewis is preaching, so um, what what can I say apart from this sermon won't be as long, <laughs> but it will be good quality, of course, because he's, he's a pretty good preacher. So I hope uh, everyone is well. Um, I hope those of you who are now able to um, get the vaccine um, have already done so, or you're um, getting to do it. The Annunciation service is 7 p.m. Yes, thanks for reminding me, Kit. So that's Thursday night, which will be the 25th um, and 7 p.m. So um, I am actually going for my first vaccine today, um, 115. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It's, it's the twofer. Um, so I'm, I did read which one it was, but having air in between my ears rather than the brain, um, it's kind of... I can't remember what, what it is, <laughs> which one it is. But I really don't care. I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Even if it, it were, you know, one of the new ones, um, they've done all the tests and everything seem, seems to be pretty good and the results seem to be good. And I'd soon be vaccinated than not vaccinated. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I've also already got my uh, second uh, shot planned as well, uh, which is pretty good. I, I, it was a bit of a bind getting on the website and I, I did try on Sunday to get on, but it was just, I kept getting, although it got cert to a certain place, it was, I was getting knocked off all the time. But fortunately, I had already booked this one prior to uh, uh, Sunday, so I'm, I'm just sticking with it. So there we are. So um, I'm sure you won't see me on Thursday with Father Lewis with three heads or anything. Um, so, you know, it's it's going to be... I'm going to feel a lot better just because I won't have that sort of shadow hanging over me, a cloud hanging over me of who am I with and have they taken the same number of precautions as I have. Of course, I still will be social distancing and I still will be wearing a mask, so those things won't change. It's just that uh, um, the the vaccine is going to make sure that, um, you know, please God, that I don't catch the uh, the virus, COVID-19. 
the jury's still out, I believe, as to whether you can still harbour the virus and then transmit it to somebody else, which is the reason why we should still uh, maintain social distancing and do all the other stuff we're supposed to do, wear a mask, um, until we get the all clear, until there are enough people that um, have been vaccinated. And uh, as always, I just do not understand people who think that wearing a mask is such a burden. I really don't. Um, I, I saw a meme which talked about people, you know, wanting to tote a gun and uh, die for the country, and that's called patriotism, yet they won't wear a, a mask, uh, to possibly to save the lives of others, because it's about their personal freedom. I mean, yeah, I don't think uh, I could have put it any better. So good morning, Jan, and good morning, Pam. So uh, just to update those of you who've joined, there is a service on Thursday evening, the 25th, uh, which is for the Annunciation, and that's at 7 p.m. And if you'd like to join us in person, that's great. Uh, otherwise, we will be streaming live. So uh, there we go. So this is our last time. Next week, we, uh, we have Holy Week. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a lot quieter for me. I don't have to do any prep or anything apart from for the services. Um, but I, I'm going to miss this because uh, I've enjoyed putting in the time both um, for, for this session on Tuesday and for Thursday. Uh, it really is good fun. Um, one day, perhaps, we will do a live recording of uh, a live stream of Father Lewis and myself trying to prepare for Thursday. Um, you wouldn't believe the amount of arguing back and forth that goes on. And then we'll, you know, we're like squirrel and we go down this rabbit hole of complete meaninglessness. Uh, and, um, and then we start laughing. Um, it's good fun. But uh, at the end of it all, uh, we do, well, we have so far managed to come out with something that, uh, um, has made at least some sense to us, if nobody else. Um, so please do join us on Thursday, um, 3 p.m., uh, for our final session to do with baptism. And I can already tell you it's going to be a pretty good one. So without further ado, let us move into the final two stations of this year's Station of the Cross, uh, stations 13 and 14, and I'm going to start off with a prayer uh, and end with a prayer this time. So this prayer comes from um, Pope John Paul II. Uh, oh, good morning, Holly. Um, and the, the final prayer um, comes from, um, so the closing prayer is from the book Praying the Stations of the Cross by Margaret Adam Parker and Catherine Sonderegger. Um, and it's published by Eerdman Publishing Co. Eerdman's Publishing Co. I've left, uh, if not the link, I've, I've put it down below in the notes. Uh, it's a wonderful book. It is, um, how can I put it? It takes you uh, on a journey which is, uh, uh, probably the best way of putting it, is far more political than anything I think I would do um, in in terms of the stations of the cross and when i talk about political i don't mean to do with republican and, and democratic it's to do with the um the kind of social justice uh element of um poverty and homelessness and women's rights and you know human trafficking and all these things which are going on in our world which these two people, when they look at the Stations of the Cross and they begin their prayers, this is what they've seen. Um, so I would commend it to you, like I would commend pretty much every book on the Stations of the Cross. You're going to get something out of it, whatever it says. Um, and But this one is not really transferable for uh, me to go around and speak at the Stations of the Cross in church. This is very much a personal journey that you you would you would take it take the book yourself, um, and either uh, make your house uh, and pin stations of the cross all over the place that you can print you've printed off, um, or go to the, go to the church and use those stations uh, as the visual aid for what they say. So I would commend that to you. Uh, also, I'd commend it as a practice, whatever the time of year. 
Anyway, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, fill our hearts with the light of your Spirit, so that by following you and your final journey, we may come to know the price of our redemption and become worthy of a share in the fruits of your passion, death and resurrection. You who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The thirteenth station. Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. From the Gospel of Luke. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. And from the prophet Jeremiah, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children, because they are no more. The journey in this world ended for Jesus as it does for all of us when he died. But there are those left behind who are required to carry on, who need to try to understand, cope with and make sense of what has happened. We are so used to seeing babes in arms and children on their mother's knee or being cradled for comfort. It's what babies and young children do. They run up to their mothers for comfort when life overwhelms them. They seek safety from a cruel world. Here, though, Mary holds not a baby but a full-grown man, yes, her son, one broken by the world, one bleeding and battered almost out of recognition. This isn't the way things are supposed to be. For one, parents aren't supposed to outlive their children. For two, this wasn't how things were supposed to go. Mary recalls the archangel's greeting. Hail, highly favoured one. Yes, Mary was favoured. She saw her baby grow up and begin to do unimaginable things. She saw him debating with the best of rabbis. She saw him save a wedding feast. She saw him bring the dead back to life. She saw the hope of Israel and believed God's angel. But now? Surely the words of Simeon were now ringing through her ears. This child marks both the failure and the recovery of many in Israel a figure misunderstood and contradicted, the pain of a sword thrust through you. Oh, what pain! Yet how many times has Mary held her breath, especially during these past few years? The praise and glory her son has received was equally matched with fear, jealousy, opposition, and the real threat of violence. Was this what Simeon had meant? Was it supposed to be this way? Was God still at work? Here? Was God going to bring about something unexpected through the corpse that laid in her arms? How many other women have held their breath and hoped? How many still grieve the loss of a stillbirth? or mourn the victim of a sudden infant death syndrome? How many mothers lose a child through disease, or drugs, or accident, and plead to God for it not to be real, for it to turn into something life-giving and beautiful? 
for the hurt of love to become the joy of reunion. And yet it must seem that God is as silent as those still bodies, as remote from those who grieve as the souls of their children. Each mourning mother kneels at the foot of their own Calvary, united to each other and to Mary in a way that is similar and yet unique to each. Unlike Mary, though, mothers can now hope. At the moment, Mary is completely in the dark. Wrapped up as she is in her pain and loss, it cannot possibly make any sense that resurrection could be a possibility. Sure, Jesus could raise the dead, but who would raise him once he was gone? For the answer to that question, Mary had only a few days to wait. For all mourning mothers today, we have to hold them in prayer and in faith, that they do not just believe, but know that they will see their children once again, that God will prove himself in wiping away their every tear, that, as in the pain of birth, so the pain of loss will disappear like a dream, to be replaced with eternal joy as they are reunited. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the hope. This is the life. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us your peace. The fourteenth station. Jesus is laid in a tomb. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. Late in the afternoon, since it was the day of preparation, that is, Sabbath Eve, Joseph of Arimathea, a highly respected member of the Jewish council, came. He was one who lived expectantly, on the lookout for the kingdom of God. Working up his courage, he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate questioned whether he could be dead that soon and called for the captain to verify that he really was dead. Assured by the captain, he gave Joseph the corpse. Having already purchased a linen shroud, Joseph took him down, wrapped him in the shroud, placed him in a tomb that had been cut in the rock and rolled a large stone across the opening. Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of Joseph, watched the burial. From the book of Revelation. I saw heaven and earth new created, gone the first heaven, gone the first earth, gone the sea. I saw holy Jerusalem new created, descending resplendent out of heaven, as ready for God as a bride for her husband. I heard a voice thunder from the throne. Look, look, God has moved into the neighbourhood, making his home with men and women. They are his people, he's their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good, tears gone, crying gone, pain gone. All the first order of things gone. The enthroned continued. Look, I'm making everything new. Write it all down, each word dependable and accurate. There's something peculiar about death. The first thing you notice is that it's not at all frightening. Of all the things you imagined death would be, it wasn't this. 
The second thing you notice is that everything seems to go quiet. It's as if the whole universe is paying attention and is, if only for a short while, paying homage to the life that is no more. That silence has followed the body of Jesus from the foot of his cross to his resting place, a borrowed tomb. The contrasts couldn't be sharper. The noise and the din of chiselling out a hole versus the calm and the sorrow surrounding the person for whom that hole was hewn. The chiselling and noise is reminiscent of what was happening, happening around the temple that isn't too far away. It's still in the process of being rebuilt. I wonder if anyone has in mind what Jesus said but a short while ago. I wonder if anyone has looked at his lifeless body for signs of of, well, that's the thing. Jesus often spoke in ways that would only make sense later. Remember that time when he said, Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. What was Jesus going on about when he said that? We have to hurry. There will Things have to be done in a haphazard way for now. The proper ceremonials can wait a couple of days. I mean, it's not as if Jesus would be going anywhere, is it? Meanwhile, we will do our duty at the temple. We will do what is required of us by law. And yet, well, things just don't feel the same. Something has shifted. It's like that temple is now an empty shell. It's like its former glory has departed. Grief. That's what it is. We have to get used to the new normal of life without Jesus. But there's something, a yearning deep within. Even as we walk away from the tomb, it feels like there's unfinished business. It feels like it feels like a new dawn is going to break. I am the bread of life. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. What wacky things Jesus said. <laughs> and yet... And yet they didn't seem wacky when he said them. There was an authority even his enemies recognised. He was the brightest of lights, a light that upset too many. But he wouldn't dim his light, and so it had to be snuffed out. But can such a light be extinguished? Can it be put out for all eternity? We wait. We wait to see. Is that what we're supposed to do? Or is something going to happen that defies, well, that defies everything? I wish it made sense. I wish it was as easy to perceive as those lepers Jesus made clean. As easy as seeing that man take up his bed and walk. Trusting God, Jesus tells us, but how hard is that when all seems hopeless, all seems desolate? And how are we to see when the light has gone out of the world, when it looks like the darkness has won once again? Lord Jesus, think on me and purge away my sins. From earth-born passions set me free and make me pure within. Lord Jesus, think on me, with care and woe oppressed. Let me thy loving servant be, and taste thy promised rest. Lord Jesus, think on me, nor let me go astray. Through darkness and perplexity, point thou the heavenly way. Lord Jesus, think on me, 
that when the flood is past, I may eternal brightness see and share thy joy at last. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, our times are in your hands. You alone know in full the seasons of our lives, the days of joy and strength renewed, the night seasons of sorrow and aching loss, the quick exaltation of gifts given and received, the light restored after sickness or wrong. You encompass them in your greatness, O Lord. You alone make them small, at rest in the palm of your hand. Bring us, we pray, into your presence, where this pilgrimage of ours will end. Let this way of the cross rise up to your throne, and may we even now glimpse our little deaths turned over into life even as your Son went down among the lost to bring up the prisoners and set them free. Make his way a blessing and guide for us, and grant us grace to be light along this way for those who have wandered away, and to welcome them home as you have welcomed us. All this we ask in the name of the one who is Lord of all seasons and days, the man of sorrows and the Lord of glory, even Jesus Christ. Amen.